show you the plan for my thesis that is about genomic epigenetic and physiology divergent in spatial toads response to pond Ryan. So first I want to make a brief overview of the things I'm gonna talk. The, how the environmental fluctuations can affect the evolution of plastic traits of a species and present your our study system that uh, has some species have evolved in these fluctuation environments and so not so they can be an example of geno ge genetic accommodation and some of the interesting traits that they have that are larval period, uh, genome size, the metabolism and the morphology and finish with the chapters that I will make for, for my thesis that are about the genomic architectures, the effects of of the genome size and on cell replication and metabolic rate, the epigenetic and transcriptomic changes that are underlying um, plastic response to, to low water levels and a link between the gene expression and the physiology and morphology traits. So we all know that Doñana is an environment that fluctuates uh, a lot through, through the years, that they have a lot of spawns that are temporal and some years they have more water or they have less water and the species have uh, adapted to to these fluctuations. One of the species adapted to that is the space food toad Pelobates cultripes that uh, can develop faster if they detect that it's a dry year and they detect the low water levels and they accelerate their development. And some species of this group have evolved in more um, constant environments, so they lost this ability of change their, or not completely lost, but almost lost this ability to change their uh, larval period. Here is a pelodates that have been breeding in high water conditions against low water conditions. You can see changes in morphology and also in the total time of their larval period. So uh, Pelobates cultripes is part of the group of spatial toads that have diverged and into uh, old world uh, spatial toads that live in Europe and concretely in the Iberian Peninsula and that are more, um, uh, they, they have been developing in, in these fluctuation, in fluctuating environments while the New World Space Food Toad, uh, Family Scaphifodidae, uh, breeds in more ephemeral ponds, so they tend to develop faster. They are, here are the species I work with. There are four species, uh, Scaphiopus cochai, Spea multiplicata, Pelodites ibericus, and Pelobates cultripes, and they diverge a lot in the larval uh, development time, and European species that are pelobates and pelodites take more time to complete their development, while American species take shorter times. In this group of anurans, we find the shortest and one of the largest uh, larval periods because Caphiopus can last like eight days and complete their development. So uh, they, they show this developmental plasticity that is a response to environmental condition of the phenotype. In anurans, it depends on several factors. So they can be the temperature, the photovolatility, the presence of predators, and the water levels, that this is our case. And that they not only uh, diverge in, in the total time of their development, but also in the plasticity of the trait. When we compare reaction norms after exposing them to low water levels, we see that uh, pelobates and pelodites can shorten uh, their larval periods, while, while Scaphiopus and Spea don't change much their larval period. And what uh, pelobates and pelodites express is more similar to what the common ancestor will express. So in the end, they change the total time of their development and also the plasticity of the trait. And this is something that um, can be related to what we call genetic accommodation. Genetic accommodation is a um, way of mm, diversification in which a novel phenotype can be established in the population and 
what when they have uh, different uh, conditions in the environment we first uh, start with a fluctuating environment environment or heterogeneous that and and we have the um, a species that have plasticity to respond to this environment and the lineages uh, move to new environment regimens in which they lose their plasticity to express one extreme of the of the phenotype and this is canalized and the they like inherited the the loss of this plasticity and they fix the the um, the new phenotype losing their their plasticity so this is very controversial because it's a case in which epigenetic precede uh, genetic changes and we know that in our system there are genomic changes because they present different uh, sizes of the genome. If we look at the C values of the species, the species that develop in more time and are more plastic have higher values of, of the genome, while uh, American species that develop faster and with less plasticity um, have um, um, lo uh, smaller genomes. And we know that the, the size of the genome is not related to the complexity of the organism, neither the number of genes, that is more due to the non-coding region they have in their genome, as they can be regulatory regions, tandem repeats, introns, and transposable elements. So this is one of the parts that I would like to, to look at. And we know also that in annuidans, um, there is a negative correlation between uh, the temperature and and the permetamorphic development with the genome sizes. Uh, animals that live in warmer environments tend to have a smaller genomes and develop faster. And one of the reasons that they can be happening is because uh, replicate a bigger genome requires more time and resources. So this also have implications in, in the metabolism morphology, these changes in the genome and in the development. We know that when they accelerate they start a response in the hypothalamic pituitary intrarenal axis, and they start to produce a thyroid hormone, a corticosterone, and have a higher metabolic rate that is also linked to oxidative stress. In the morphology, we see that they change in size in the amount of fat bodies they have and the snout length and the limb length that we can see here with some species. The more plastic species tend to have longer limbs and longer snouts, while the less plastic uh, smaller one. And when, when we expose uh, more plastic species to low water levels, they have the metamorphoses are smaller and they have a shorter length, uh, limb length and snout length. So these are the chapters of my thesis. First one, look at the genomic architecture and not only the size, but the architecture of the genome uh, has changed through the species. So I want to look at the non-coding regions and also the orthologous groups that have been conserved, then make a relationship between this genome size with the, the replication rate and the metabolic rate. Uh, because uh, replicating a bigger genome requires more time and resources. Then uh, after exposing animals to, to the low water level, see their response, their plastic response, and how this is, uh, uh, the changes are that are underlying that in epigenetic and transcriptomic level. And focus then in the fourth chapter in one candidate gene that can be linking, be linking this gene expression with the morphology and, and the physiology changes that's the hormone leptin. So, <laughs> um, others, we took uh, samples for uh, build the genomes, samples of DNA and RNA for the annotations. From embryos, we measure cell replication and metabolic rate. And in these embryos, we perform some staining and some respirometry. 
uh, for the third chapter, we we did this experiment in which we exposed them to low water levels to extract tissues for DNA and RNA to see the genetic and epigenetic changes, and then compare the results with the reaction norms of the clutch and the size there of the metamorphs. And finally, to link the this expression with the morphology, measure the hormone leptin, this candidate gene, in different parts of the body. The the tadpoles were the of the four species were all bred in the same condition, and we took uh, some um, animals from the field, some parts of clutches of the field of the Iberian animals, the Pelobates and Pelodites, and we breed in the lab, the American species that we have in our colony. Once we have the, the tadpoles, we individualize them in three little buckets with food uh, unrestricted bas based on spinac and uh, rabbit chow, and maintain them in the same condition of temperature, uh, the night day cycle, and the humidity. So, uh, I'm going to start explaining the, the genome chapter. Well, we uh, for for the, make these comparisons, we need well-assembled genomes at chromosome level. We already have one, the Pelobates genome, that have been published uh, some years ago. And they use uh, short, long reads and high-C data to build it. And we are waiting for the BGP project uh, to assemble or, or genomes that we send them some samples, also short, long reads and high C, high C data. And we, we are planning to perform ourselves the annotation. I will use, I think, the pipeline of Breaker 3 that is uh, right now the best for vertebrate genomes. And these are some exploratory analysis that I've been trying to do. Here I compare the the genomes in pair bases against the percentage of transposable elements, these non-coding uh, elements that I've mentioned in different species of anurans. And we can see that in the case of Pelobates cultripes that have a bigger genome, the percentage of these elements is more than 50%. In, in the case of Escathiopus, that has a much smaller genome, the percentage is like 27% almost. So they have reduced these elements. And looking at the categories, we see that most of them are unclassified elements because these programs are based on model organisms. And in these models, we don't have annotated yet these elements. And, but we can see in certain families are uh, long terminal repeats that there are uh, significant changes. And not I want to look at not only the non-coding region, but also the structure of the coding regions. So here is, there is a synteny plot that I learned to do in a short stance in the Science Nature Museum in Madrid the Riesgo lab. And what I present here are the chromosome in order of size. And comparing them in two species that have diverged like 150 million years ago, we can see that more of the chromosome remain, more of the autobus have conserved, but there are a few changes. For example, chromosome one of SPIA multiple of SPIA has been divided into five and, and six, and part of the six is also coming from the 13. So yeah, we have some certain changes in the architecture of the chromosomes. Yeah, uh, well, I've changed to, to the second chapter that it's about the, <clears throat> the relationship between the genome size and the cell replication and metabolic rate. So I, I took some decapsulated embryos from early stages in which you can even see ahead to uh, the completed stages where they start to develop the limb. And I performed some stainings on the cells in the nucleus and, and the membranes. 
to see the relationship between uh, the area of the nucleo and the cytoplasm, and also some some stainings of the uh, nucleo and the mitotic nucleus to look at the replication rate, how many cells have been replicated against the total number of cells that we can find in the tissue. And this is a collaboration with Clotilde de Cardar and Pepe Urbano. He's doing the imaging with confocal microscopy in in CAP. And these are two of the images that we have already obtained. So we've been able to perform the, the staining. And I want to compare also these replication rates with the um, uh, metabolic rate the, the embryos have. So we have this uh, micro res uh, oligo system that is an aquatic close respirometry um, measure. And we, we measure the oxygen consumption. Uh, we put uh, one embryo per, per hole here in the microplate. We close it to avoid the entrance of oxygen and we wait how they consume the oxygen and then wait them. And what we expect to see is that American species that have a uh, constitutively higher metabolic rate will consume oxygen faster than uh, the European species. But we don't know yet because maybe it changes through the um, embryo development. And I move to the third chapter in which we perform the experiment of uh, acceleration. So we breed some tadpoles of the four species again, and when they reach Gosner 35, then they start to form the indentation. We put them in low water condition for 24 hours and 72 hours, and we extract tissues from the tail and the liver. The tail because it's uh, one tissue that changes a lot when they accelerate, they become thinner, and the liver because it's um, uh, very important in metabolism. And we expect it to have some RNA seq data. And we expect that uh, species that are more plastic after this acceleration uh, present more um, activated or repressed genes than species that are uh, less plastic and don't change much. With the same condition and the same experiment, we are planning to extract some DNA uh, to obtain data for a taxic. And a taxi is a technique that allows us to see open and closed regions of chromatin. And we, we want to see is the, if the regulatory regions, the possible enhancers and uh, sites of, you know, of transcriptional factors uh, that are driving these changes in the expression. So in the end, what we want is to like get a bit more closer of see the genetic complexity of this trait that we call uh, the developmental acceleration that is composed by different genes and re regulations. And we will uh, let some of tadpoles of the same clutch finish the metamorphosis to see the reaction norms, if they actually accelerate or not, and which size they have when they finish metamorphosis. And <clears throat> I move to the fourth chapter and to link this expression with the morphology changes. And we know that they change a lot in the in the fat bodies they have. Uh, if we compare uh, uh, American and Iberian animals also, and when they accelerate, they also reduce their fat bodies. And there are some experiments, previous experiments that uh, seen that in pelobates, after exposing them to low water levels, they change the expression of genes about lipid met biosynthesis and metabolism and cholesterol and esteroids. So, and then we see changes in the limb size, and there is a hormone, leptin, that is, uh, it has a major role in the metabolism of fats. It's produced in fats and also affects. Um, for example, the glucocorticoid um, metabolism and 
in some experiments in neurons, it's shown that uh, leptin can act as a growth factor and induce uh, the, in the in the intention of the limbs. So this hormone is a gene that can be acting at different points in in the response. Um, we are doing a collaboration with Erika Crespi in Washington State University to look at the leptin um, the receptors in the tadpoles. First, we have to characterize them. And by quantitative PCR and immunostochemistry, we want to measure leptin after being exposed of 72 hours of low water in different tissues of, of the tadpoles from liver, limbs, fat bodies, terminal bridge, gut, and brain. These different tissues because, for example, uh, we can expect to um, find more leptin in fat bodies as it's producing fats, but more receptors in, in the limbs, are, they are responding to the leptin. And what is my progress so far? I've done uh, just a little bit of the genome because we have one of the genomes, we need other three. And I've been learning the the programs and the analysis I have to do, but I don't have the opportunity to do it yet. With the embryo staining and respirometry, I'm very advanced. I have almost finished all the samples and they are doing the collaboratives doing the imaging. And we only have one species uh, data for, well, tissues for uh, RNA in a taxi and we have done almost half of the samples of letting so there is a lot of work to do yet and i want to say thank you to my supervisors to my amazing group the lab technician and college in the EVD that are always working and my collaborators and thank you all for your attention and my yeah thank you very much quite uh, complete and, uh, and challenging so I have a question about the uh, the conceptual uh, framework of the genetic accommodation uh, uh, concept. Yeah. So I, I think that the, in theoretical uh, uh, models and empirical data actually suggest that in fluctuating environments, uh, harsh and good environments promote canalization and plasticity alternatively. Mm -hmm. So I've seen this picture before, and it's always you know confusing and and. Uh, yeah. So why do you expect, unless you have data that this is going to happen, why do you expect, you know, this kind of uh, canalization events when the environment changes towards the uh, the extremes? Because I think that the evidence suggests, you know, that uh, if if uh, if you reduce variability, mm, sorry, you know, so. Yeah, but I think that variability in some times can have. Uh, uh, a negative effect on the fitness. We are looking at, for example, at the genome size and having a bigger genome size when you have to develop faster is negative for your fitness because you need more time and resources. So maybe this is one of the reasons that you can lose this plasticity because if you do the non-coding regions that you can re remove from the genome. Well, that's my concern about a scenario in which organisms lose plasticity. No. Not sure whether this is happening in the wild, I think th or to what extent this is happening. You know, this kind of this kind of things. And are we talking about genetic variation in a population or plasticity plasticity within individuals? Both. Anyway, that's I, I leave it uh, there. You know, I always found this. Uh, Anyway, and just a, a minor comment, mm -hmm. when you give a presentation in an international uh, conference, avoid the old world, new world thing, you know, that's a new European centric colony okay. thing, not good. Okay. So it's Africa, it's Europe, it's America, you know, but there's no old new world okay. anymore, mm -hmm. fortunately. Thank you. More questions? Ah, what yeah. am I saying? If not, uh, you say that you expect more expression in those species that are more plastic. 
more differential expression after being exposed to the water level treatment. Okay. And do you, you plan, plan to correct it by genome size? size? I, I guess because those yes. plastics are half. Well, well did, those, did, those, those ones, ones that you expect that they're, well, no, no, the, the ones that are more plastic are those ones with more genome size? Yeah, not just the genome size, but the number of genes, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, they have similar number of genes. It's the non-coding parts that are different. And with regard to the comparison of the dog and the, of the four genomes, do you have <laughs> expectations for the functional parts of the genome, or basically you are focusing your interest on the non-coding parts just to see? transposable elements or so on, or you have also expectations on what genes should show higher selective forces, or do you have different expectations? Yeah. What are you expecting? I expect that maybe finding some ortho groups that maybe can be lost, or or we, we compare like the Iberian species and the American species in, in the genome that can be related to this plasticity maybe. So I have to first like set which genes are changing in the expression, see if some K genes are not present and then and then look at the genome um, changes uh, if the ortho groups disappear or not. Because one problem that you may have here is that you have a um, correlated evolutionary history and ecological changes that the two American species that are more closely related are also the ones that are uh, more extreme environments, maybe, or more um, so the same ecological patterns, not the same changes in the oh. faster development. Oh. So that maybe that will be confusing the evolution, evolutionary history and the selective forces. I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm uh -huh. just wondering what kind of yeah. thoughts you have about this. Yeah. Any more questions? So thanks, Paula. Thank you. Dar es Salam uh, University, also master in Nelson Mandela University of Life Science, specialized in biodiversity conservation, and now he's doing his PhD. He's in the third year also in the University of Dar es Salaam and uh, supervised by the Dr. Willick Nagelson, Dr. Simon Loder and Christopher Lierke. He's doing the I stay here, right? So thank you very much. Dr. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share my PhD plan. I'm John Liakurua and I'm a PhD student from the University of Dar es Salaam. I'm doing my PhD project titled Canary in the Coal Mine, the taxonomic stat the ecology and taxonomic status of forest toads in central eastern Yaki Mountains of Tanzania. And I um, have three supervisors, supervisors as Man has explained. To start with the introduction, there are many reports that have reported the alarming rates of biodiversity uh, loss currently. And amphibians are at the very top of the list. They are currently the most threatened vertebrates on Earth. And last year, an assessment was done, a global assessment on the status of amphibian species. And they highlighted a couple of things, one which is the global distribution of amphibian species, most of which are concentrated on the tropics. But also, they highlighted that some areas have been given less attention, and that's particularly the case for Africa. We have a lot of places in Africa which have been have not been surveyed, but we also have a lot of amphibian groups which are poorly known in taxonomic sense. And so in those kind of situations, it's very difficult to confidently highlight areas of high biodiversity. The same... The same assessment also highlighted a number of areas which are highly threatened and in Africa although it's poorly known there are a couple of areas which also contain large number of species which are at the brink of extinction and in particular is this area here in East Africa this is largely the eastern Yaki mountains where my studies focused on that part there 
highly rich, poorly known, and many species uh, with taxonomic problems. These mountains, they include 13 isolated mountain blocks in Tanzania and Kenya, and they are very special in biodiversity conservation because they have the highest concentration of endemic vertebrates globally. And in Tanzania, 13 mountain, among the 13 mountains, 12 were found in Tanzania and one in Kenya, the Taita Hills. And these are very special in Tanzania because we have 85 endemic amphibian species and 65 of them were only restricted to these mountains. So they are very special for amphibian conservation in Tanzania. And this is where my study is going to put more focus on, on the central eastern Arc mountains, focusing on three isolated mountain blocks, Uluguru, Usambara, and Guru mountains. These mountains, yes, they are special for biodiversity, but they are highly threatened. And this has been reported over many decades. And what we have now in the eastern Arc mountains is only 30% of what used to be originally. And Yearly, we are, using, we are losing around 03 to 1.7% of the forest cover in these mountains. So it's very alarming, specifically also because most amphibians in these mountains are single block endemics, and they have very localized the distribution. In these mountains, usually this is what we see. On the left is how we see it from the above. So the canopy, this is the like from the canopy. And this is typical understory, which is very complex. But on the right is what is now happening. People are clearing to plant cardamom. And what they are doing basically is to clear the understory. And in most cases, the canopy is still intact. And that's very difficult also to detect in satellite images. So in most cases, the satellite images have also been somehow underestimating the current situation. And now taxonomy is important for conservation. Because we know species are fundamental units for biodiversity and crucial for conservation. And taxonomy is what define what species are. And usually conservation efforts are concentrated in areas of high biodiversity. And those are areas with high number of species. So if a species is poorly defined, it means there is a possibility of misdirecting conservation efforts. But also there is a risk of undetected extinction losing things which are not even described. So identifying taxonomy is very important in those aspects. So for this study, the main focus is to revise the taxonomy of Eastern Arc mountain amphibians, and I'm going to explain in detail why that's, that's important, so as to inform the future conservation efforts. And in achieving this, my thesis is sectioned into four chapters. The first chapter is more introductory, revising the current status of amphibian conservation in East Africa. And the second is more of a case study of a very small forest in my study area. This is very small forest, about four square kilometers. We sampled it intensively and we are using it to highlight the current situation. My third chapter is the main thing on taxonomy. And in this one, we are using integrative taxonomic approaches to try to define what are forest toads because they are poorly known. I'm going to explain it in detail. So we are using calls, recording a lot of acoustics from the field. We are also using a lot of morphometric analysis and genetic analysis to try to understand what the taxonomic status of these toads. And the last chapter is estimating the amphibian decline and extinction based on long-term survey data. And for this one, we are mostly using the museum kept materials, records, but also using the biodiversity database. So GBIF and searching in VetNet database to see what their records which are there and collecting with the recent surveys that we've been conducting. So to achieve this, it needs a lot of field work. And for those who have never been to East Africa or to tropical forests, this is what it usually takes. Usually we start our field journey to town. So buying all the necessary things like heavy duty batteries and those kind of things because they are not available in villages. And then we travel by a bus for three to eight hours depending on the location of the forest we are going. And thereafter we hire motorbikes. 
this. We hire motorbikes and because mostly we sample amphibians during the rain season, this is the typical condition of the most of the roads. Sometimes we hire cars and we use them straight from town and we try to push as much as we can close to the forest, so to villages close to the forest. And usually we encounter a lot of erosion and sometimes the roads are blocked because of rainfall. So sometimes we have to do a bit of work to open up the roads. And when that's not possible, we hire motorbikes to carry everything to the nearby uh, village. And then once we reach the village, we assemble porters who usually they help us to carry everything to the forest. And usually it takes a hike with every, we carry everything and hike for between 30 minutes to 80 hours, depending on the site we are going within the forest. And once we reach there, we camp usually for a week at each site. And once we are camped there, the first thing we usually set back at pitfall traps and we monitor them for about a week. And also we use time constraint searching. So searching for amphibians during the night are long established transects. And all the individuals we encounter, the amphibians that we encounter, we do take representative tissue samples for genetic analysis, but also representative vulture specimens for taxonomy. We take photos in localities for every individual that we encounter. And for males that we find them calling, we also do record the calls also for taxonomic uh, analysis. We are also collecting a lot of environmental data from data loggers. We have data loggers at each site and they've been recording for 15 months now. And we are recording the same environmental data like leaf litter, canopy cover for every individual that we encounter in the forest. Morphometrics is also important. We are doing a lot of morphological measurements for specimens which are in the museum, but for the ones which we have been collecting. And then why forest toads are important canaries to answer these questions. Forest toads contain two genera, churamiti and nectophanoides, and the churamiti is monotypic. It has only one a species in the genus, and this is critically endangered, endemic to central eastern Yaki Mountains, and it has never been seen for more than 20 years, poorly known. And Nectophanoides contain about 13 described species, all endemic to Tanzania, but also we are aware there have been a couple of records recently which they don't fit in any of the 13 described species. And this, this is a very special group of amphibians because of their breeding biology. They give birth to live young ones, and that's represented by a fraction of amphibians in, within the anurine group. Only 0.2% of anurans, they have that breeding biology. So it's a group of um, very special amphibians. And most of these members in this genus, Nectophanoides, have been put together mostly because of their reproductive mode. But recent analysis have shown that they are not related. And we now know there are some other groups which they give birth to live young ones, and they are not in this group. Not from Tanzania, from somewhere else. There are some other species with that reproductive mode, and they are in different uh, genus. They are also highly threatened. So currently, Nectophanoides, among the 13 species, all are either endangered or critically endangered, except these ones. This is already extinct in the wild, this one. These two are data deficit. This is only known from three specimens, and this has never been recorded since its discovery. And these two, sorry, these two are the only least concerned species but there is a study which has shown that they are, they are cryptic. So they have also some taxonomic uh, issues. This is an example of one of the two species which are least concerned. Currently it's considered as one species. It was described from the Southern Highlands, but we now know they occur in these other five mountain blocks. And preliminary analysis indicates that each mountain 
contain a distinct uh, species. So all these are undescribed. And some of the mountains, they are known to have more than one uh, distinct or undescribed group. And they are very different morphologically. If you are given, you can even tell where they are coming from, the mountain. But also their calls, they are very different between mountains. Like that one is the call from one of the mountains. And this one is the call from another mountain. Although they are currently being considered the same species, but you can hear the calls, they are very different. And morphologically, there are some notable differences as well. So the current status with the taxonomic uh, chapter, we have estimated the number of lineages based on morphology, geography, and natural history. There are around 30 units within Nectophanoides group. And now we are doing the phylogenetic analysis. And we have established the preliminary tree, which mostly contain one group, but it shows this is paraphyletic. Most of these are representing one, what is one species currently, and it shows they are paraphyletic and they have very deep divergences. And this is largely part of my stay here at EBD to do the training on molecular barcoding, but also to do the lab work. And thankfully, this is supported by the ICUP project. These two have been reported to have uh, uh, independent branching within the nectophanoides. So they don't branch with the other nectophanoides group. And this was reported by a very recent uh, paper which described a new genus in Kenya. And so we are now collaborating with Hendrik Muller from Germany to do some CT scans of members of the family Bufonide. So most all the genus of the members of the genus Bufonide trying to establish what defines this nectophanoides and that there is a possibility of def describing a new uh, genus. We have examined specimens. We have measured around 500 museum specimens. And from observing the specimens, one of the interesting things was from these two. These have been recorded as missing since their description in 1971. They've been reported as they have never been recorded. But from observing the museum specimens, we came across 90 specimens which represent this one. And some were collected as recently as 2000. And IUCN, if you look at the map in IUCN database, this is the distribution map they give, which is the northern part of Uluguru Mountains. But the specimens are distributed all over Uluguru Mountains. So you can see how poorly known taxa sometimes can affect the conservation initiatives. This is from IUCN. And these are the pictures I managed to record in the field recently. With the last chapter on long-term uh, biodiversity assessment, the Eastern Yaki Mountains contain very long history of collection, which is spanned from 1900. But unfortunately, most of these reports, these are surveys, each map represents a single survey. Most of these surveys have never been put together to analyze if there are some long-term patterns. And we recently tried to analyze that in Yukaguru Mountains, and that's what I'm going to share in the next slides. So we put together all the surveys in Yukaguru Mountains. The mountain contain about six isolated forest reserves. And what we discovered that is that was that most of the surveys in this mountain were concentrated on only two forest reserves. So the four forest reserves in these mountains were not surveyed for amphibians up to now. And from this study we also highlighted that there has been forest loss of around 0.3 percent per year from these mountains. And of interest are these three amphibians. They are all members of Buffoni, the family, and they've been missing across surveys, as you can see. This one is only from two surveys, and it has never been recorded from around 2004. 
The same to these two, they've been missing across surveys and that was kind of alarming with also the forest loss that we observed. And this pushed us to do more surveys in more pristine areas to see if these species are there or not. And from there, this is what we found. These are the historical sites of the two Nectophanoides species in these mountains. Still, we are missing them from these historical sites. These sites are very close to the forest age, and there is a road here connecting two villages from both forest sites. A lot of destruction we have recorded, and the species are missing. But we have recorded them in two other new localities very deep into the forest here. And they also have recorded them here, these two species. But the third one is still missing, despite all the efforts. From that analysis, we also discovered that each survey from these mountains led to a discovery of a new species. And in our survey also in 2019 discovered a new species which we described. And last year, while we are continuing with the surveys, we also came across this, which is morphological also very different. It looks like no other species in the, that mountain. And we are currently also working on to describe it. This is typically what you see in this mountain, especially on the forest edges. On the forest edges, we see a lot of destruction, people encroaching usually to plant some crops for subsistence. And these are some maize plots within the reserve. So in summary, we have noted that Species diversity is underestimated and therefore their conservation status. But also we have noted that the refined understanding of species allows monitoring through space and time, especially this is important for species that for many years they've been recorded as they are not there, but it's mostly because they have been poorly described and people have failed to detect them over the years. We have also noted that the forest toads are useful indicators for environmental change. And this is especially because they are very sensitive to the environment and we have missed them from areas which are now considered as highly disturbed and they are occurring more in more remote areas. I thank a number of collaborators who have been very supportive throughout this project. It involves a lot of people, a lot of collaborators. I thank my supervisors, They've been very supportive. This is myself and my assistant and my supervisors in one of the mountains. I also think the Ministry of Science, Innovation and Universities of Spain, who are funding my stay here in the lab work through ICUP project. And I think the Evodivo group here who are hosting and DBD, the lab technicians here who have been very supportive and of all of you for the attention. Thank you so much. Well, I have never been there. So my question is about these patches that you are describing as isolated from each other. Yes. Is those are just top of mountains, really isolated. There is, my question goes in the direction, is it possible that you are underestimating the possible, the possible distribution range for many of these species because in the intermediate areas are still suitable or, or those are just mountain habitats that are isolated, fragmented, that there is no way that the species can be found anywhere else? Yeah, that's a very good question. These are mountain areas, and they are not connected. Usually between the mountains, we have what we call unsuitable habitat, usually things like savannas, for example, and species in one block, especially with amphibians, most of them cannot move to another mountain. And they've been isolated for so many years. They are very ancient mountains. 
And we are now seeing the pattern. It's not only for amphibians, even for reptiles, we are now seeing the pattern that species which used to be one species widely distributed across the, these mountains, genetically they are being discovered to be very different. And some of them, it's even impossible to tell them apart morphologically. So they are mountain areas and they are isolated. There are some unsuitable habitats between them. And another question, yeah. Uh, it's in relationship to the meta, uh, the barcoding. Yeah. Is it based on a single gene or you're going to combine more than one do you, um, yeah. for the species identification? Because yeah, if that's... it's only mitochondrial gene, maybe a little bit limited, no? Yeah, thank you, thank you. That's a very good question. We were, the plan was to do 16A switch mitochondria and RAG1, which is nuclear, but we are now discussing on the possibilities of going further to do next generation sequencing. That's we are discussing, but the idea was to do one mitochondria and one nuclear gene. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So do they have lowland relatives or are these groups only in the mountains? This Lectophanoides, they are forest species and all on the mountains, yeah. I have one myself, uh, like in the revision that you did, yeah. uh, do you find any species that are not declining? So like that you're a bit more? For this group and many other buffonids, we, we, are seeing, we are experiencing decline. Yeah, especially for members of this family. For almost all the species, we are experiencing decline. Yeah. And your hypothesis is because of the fragmentation that they are, like the habitat loss that they are having. Yeah, yeah. There are some few which we recorded more individuals, but not because they are more, it's because of the effort that we have put in. And if we somehow correct that with the, the number of individuals that we found with the effort that we have put in, you see that's not the case, yeah. Notice. Okay, so I guess that we can close. John will be here until the end of June, no? So yeah, yeah, you can ask him much more yeah. and at any time. Okay, thanks to all. Thank you.